Last week we uh, talked about the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people who have no religious affiliation. This week we're going to, our jumping off point is going to be nuns, N-U-N-S. Uh, when you think, in your mind's eye, of an N-U-N-S nun, what comes to mind? Say, say it loud, I can't hear you. Service. Service. Habits. Habits. The long veils. The long veils and pointy hats. No, Fly away. No, no. <laughs> I'm not really that old. I didn't see that. What else? My friends from Catholic school stories. Oh, yeah. Of really sweet old ladies, and then the other ones slap you on the hand. Way in the back, what's your image? Rulers on the hand. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Mary Lou, did you ever get a ruler on the No, you were just, you were so good. But, Dean? Full station wagons. Full station wagons? Did they carry you around back in the day? Seven or eight nuns in one. Like, kind of, I don't want to make the clown connection there at all. I've known a few nuns in my life. I've known a lot more monks in my life. Um, there was a, a little period, kind of a ridiculous period of my life, where I considered being a monk. I, you were first. Who did it? She did it first. I knew someone was going to do it. I know, it's ridiculous. I might as well be a robot dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> But during, the, during that time, during that time, I, did, I took a class. I went and visited a monastery. Uh, I went through the hours where you wake up at four in the morning to, to pray. And, whew, and, uh, and, then, and then you go through other long silence and try to stay awake. It was fun. Um, actually, it was kind of fun because some of the monks, a lot of them where I went to, were scholars. And they had this beautiful library and they, and they researched. And I thought that was a, a great way to spend a life. And others of them at, at this monastery, they made honey, which I thought, that's brilliant. I could make honey and read all day. Uh, my favorite monk in this particular monastery, about 45 years old, he played racquetball. I played racquetball. They had a gym there, so we went and played racquetball. No friar tuck kind of thing. He showed up just like any nerdy 45-year-old guy with, with plastic glasses and high white socks with little red circles around the bottom of them. Uh, and and he, wasn't, he wasn't a bad racquetball player, but when I started to get a lead, and, and eventually I won the game, you might expect he would be humble and gracious. Actually, he, he, he cursed, and then he lit up a cigarette. Uh, <laughs> maybe that monk thing wouldn't be so bad. Uh, so I, I, I can't imagine you know, a little old lady in a black habit uh, doing those kind of things. Nuns just have, the, in our popular imagination, they just, they just are different. And they do service. That was the first word we had, is they do service. They give their lives to help people who need the most help. My favorite nun my whole life, uh, who gave me an image of how to be a servant, and not what to do, but how to be a servant, I met her in, uh, in Haiti. We, we, you've heard part of the story, but uh, I spent a week in Haiti with some teenagers. We spent the first two days... At a uh, at a orphanage for children with disabilities, some of them severe disabilities. It was as sad as you could imagine. A lot of religious and volunteers and workers there. None of them were nuns. The next two days we spent at a, a school for homeless boys and boys who were saved out of slavery. There's this I don't know. Slavery is not the best word. Restivik. It means kind of leftovers. So if if you're in Haiti and you can't afford one child, you have a second one. You might sell that child so that they get food in another family. Some people abuse those children. This was a school to save them from that sort of situation. A lot of those kids didn't have another safe home. They didn't also have rooms at this school, so they just slept on the roof. Or if it was raining, they just found a place to, to, to land. Very rough place. No nuns there either. But on the last day of our trip, uh, we went down to a hospice in the, uh, in the slums of Port-au-Prince. In the slums of Port-au-Prince are the worst slums in all the, in all the world. The, the, the level of filth and disgusting is just unimaginable. I, I can't describe to you what it's like. Their streets don't have um, sewers. They just have a, a pit running through the middle of them with an occasional bridge that you just throw all your trash in. And in the, in, in the, the depths here, you've got pigs running around. You've got people walking around uh, barefoot. You've got people, the poorest of the poorest of the poorest, are digging through, looking for anything they can find. And we drive through that and pull in through a gate to go to a hospital, uh, where we, a hospice where we see a bunch of nuns bouncing around, crowds of men and women 
Most of them, most of them were just sitting and staring, that thousand-yard stare. Uh, it seemed like only one nun spoke any English. Maybe she was the only one that wanted to put up with our group. Uh, usually, when, when we bring teenagers, Wes knows this, you know this, when you bring teenagers to a mission project, the leader comes, and the leader says, uh, here's all of our names, and, and here's the history of the project, and here's what you're going to do today, and here's what you shouldn't do today, and here's why you should do what you shouldn't do today, and, and, and just talks forever. Is that your experience? Yeah, younger West, that's your experience back there? Uh, this nun had none of that. She just said, um, here are nail clippers. Go and clip people's nails. And she was gone. She went off to work. I don't think that she was telling us the way to be a servant, that the, that the deepest need in the world and, and our great talents of a bunch of you know, strong kids from North Carolina, that, that wasn't like the way that things worked out, that our job was to just clip fingernails the rest of our life. The important thing here wasn't the work we did. The important thing wasn't the fact that even, we were, even that we were you know, helping these people in that way. The most important thing was that the, nun, that the nun modeled for us and that she was an example of Christ. The most important thing for me is that she was showing that faith is about service. And service is about what, doing things for people that they need done. And doing what people most need is about entering into relationships with compassion, whether or not you know the language, whether or not you have any skills, whether anything that you do is going to fix anything in the world. Nuns, especially, more than any other sorts of people I know, show us that responding to a life of faith is about doing and helping and serving with compassion. Do people need food? Feed them. Do people need just a glimpse of friendliness? Give them a smile. Use their name. Remember their name. Do people need a home? Well, let's start what we can do to take the steps of making the world and making this town a place where more homes are possible. And don't start nodding your head that, oh, it's another sermon about love and service and help. Easy, 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 amen. We can't write it off that easy. We can't because if you really trust that Jesus embodied a better way to live, and if you really trust that God tells us of a better way to be in this life thing together, helping people is going to look a little different. Helping people is going to look, sometimes it's dangerous. What Wes said and we picked the translation just so we could hear it in this language. It's not the same in your, in your pew Bibles. His said, bring the homeless poor into your, into your house, into your home. That's, that's scary. And, and, and sometimes um, love will change your life. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble, and then your light will shine out from the darkness. You're changed. Sometimes serving people will challenge who you think you are and challenge what you think about the world, and the darkness around you will be bright as noon. And sometimes, this is why you should never nod at a simple sermon about love and help and service. Sometimes serving people in need will change your minds. That's pretty dangerous stuff. So our group clipped some people's fingernails and the biggest surprise that we found walking around this hospice is that a lot of people seemed really healthy. They did. They, they, they were, you know, some, some were frail and some were old, but a lot of them were young and strong and loud and boisterous men. Uh, when I finished up doing the nail clipping and went to find my next job and some of the kids were finishing up and gathering safe in their little circle under the gazebo, I went back to the nun and I gave her all the, 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 the nail things and I said, Sister, uh, I, I thought this was a hospice because most of these people are, are, look healthy. And she said, oh, it's a hospice. All of them are dying of AIDS or tuberculosis. Some will be dying sooner than others. And she was back to work. She didn't have time for my silly questions. And so I turned around and went out the office, a little shocked, a little, a little disturbed, and, and I paused at the office, kind of looking at my kids and wondering how I was going to explain to them that, that yes, that everyone you touch is, is going to die sooner or later. And, uh, and I noticed there were a couple of people sitting, two guys, sitting right outside of their, the office, and, and they had an IV that they were just holding. And there was a woman, pregnant woman, who had an IV right into her, into her belly button, and... <laughs> She wasn't sitting. She was actually 
squatting in the gutter and taking a pee. And that gutter ran right out into the slums where those pigs and those people barefoot were walking. Some people were dying sooner than others. Now, I have no doubt that there is a time in our life and a time in our world, a time to talk and a time to organize and a time to fundraise and a time to to, to make strategy and a time to argue. And Jesus did all of those things. The early church did even more of those things. And the church today does that stuff ad nauseum. And because of it, actually, the church today is the greatest source of helping people in the history of the world. Last week, we, we really kind of uh, talked about some of, the, some of the church's mistakes and how people have really held that against the church. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. But let us not ignore the fact that the church right now around the world and in local neighborhoods everywhere, the church lobbies, the church protests. It invests in projects. It does a million things behind the scenes so that some people can come forward and help and feed and counsel and house and clothe and love and know and name, and smile, and put up with failures, and build optimism on top of all the little successes. And those sorts of actions, and the heart of servanthood behind that, all of that mirrors those moments in Jesus' life, when his actions and when his heart, they shine a light on who God is, and what God intends on the world, in a way that the organizing and the planning probably doesn't. And, and let's be clear, if, 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 I, if I'm not going to let you shake your head, nod your head, um, yes, for how easy service is, on the other side, don't, don't give up because it sounds so hard. Don't give up and say, oh, it's an enormous calling. Don't think that just doing anything real and valuable takes so much hard work and so much time and it's so risky that there's no reason to start doing it. You can't make a difference. Don't, don't feel that way either because nuns, and even though nuns and a few amazing people are called to spectacular times and places, they make a great image of service, but all of us are called, whatever we believe about God, whatever we believe about Jesus, whatever we believe about those people, whatever we believe about ourselves, all of us are called to make a difference in people's lives. It's all that easy, and it's all that hard. We are called, and some of us are called to serve with our own gifts, and in our own context, we are called to carry our own cross, whether that's volunteering at the food pantry, whether that's making sandwiches in the summertime, or just talking gently to a person in need, or working to get your neighbor some kind of help, or serving on a mission trip. As many of y'all may have noticed, my fellow youth groupers and I weren't here last week. Instead of being here, we were in beautiful Lake City, Colorado, which is in southwest Colorado, kind of near Four Corners. Along with our youth group, there was a Pueblo youth group, consisting of many faces, both new and people I've met in the past. As a youth group, we helped out the Lake City Ski Hill to help set up trails, both hiking for the summers and skiing for the winters. We also painted and primed the church, the manse, and the walkway adjoining the two. We joined in both of the Lake City Presbyterian Church services. We acted out the Bible passage of Exodus 2, 1 through 17. In case you're not familiar with that, that's when Moses shows his love and respect of God. We also helped the congregation say goodbye to their pastor, a man I myself came to respect and love. Among the new faces of the Pueblo Youth Group was a young man by the name of Waylon Flowers. Waylon, in my opinion, was the heart of the youth on the mission trip. He knew there was a time for everything, and he acted on that. Waylon was a respectful, playful, and hardworking young man. He showed everyone else on the trip his love of God, his respect of others, and his work ethic, which was extraordinary. Changing my attitude positively to work hard and have fun doing so, making God and hard work the focus of that mission trip. Waylon gave a gift greater than all others, and I hope one day I can do the same for others. This mission trip was a true gift from God. So Katie, you ready to become a nun? No. <laughs> <laughs> Real fast. Um, you know, Katie and the youth that went there, did they... Did they change the world? Did they fix a lot of stuff? Eh. 
Now, you, had, you did projects that, that had impact on people and on a town, uh, but just as importantly, probably more importantly, they just responded from their heart to their faith, to their calling. Trips like this, or, or whether in your own life, just making yourself aware of the things around you and the pains around you in the world, to, allowing yourself to, to cultivate habits of, of justice in your life, just giving a few minutes in your, of compassion in your day, those things, most importantly, shape your heart toward an attitude of love. The youth on, on this trip, just one weekend, they began to look at the world in a new way and look at themselves in a new way. They began to look at other people in need as people in need. We, the rest of us, aren't called to do things that help other people simply because that's right or because it's helpful or because it's kind. Eh. Service work is great in itself, but God made the world in such a way, at least this is the way I look at the world, God made the world in such a way that we serve each other because that shapes something in ourselves and it shapes and molds something deep about the world. A kind gesture to someone who is hurting is more than a kind gesture if it contributes to the long task of building the kingdom of God. So at least as important as the result of the service that you did for the people in need is the fact that a light shined onto the world, a world that is full of need. At least as important as the result of that service Uh, and how we do it with a joyful attitude and patience and diligence, that stuff illuminates a hope in a better world, not just a world where problems are fixed one after the other. That's what Katie gives us, and that's what the world uh, needs. And and it's not just a small impact of what she and the other youth did, but she gives us a hope that youth care, and she gives us a hope that all of us can make a difference. And bigger than Katie and the youth, bigger than nuns and Mother Teresa, bigger than what any of us could do individually or collaboratively, Jesus offers the most radical image of service and of love. In his life, of course, he healed people. One of the main things he did is he healed individuals. And then he gave compassion to people who were facing trouble in all kinds of ways. And he challenged systems that oppressed people. But, I don't know, just theological musing. Did he really accomplish much in his life? If he had cured cancer, that would have been something. If he had beaten fascism, that would have been something. Not just a theological kind of idea. But I get the sense that what he really did in life, during his life, is to help, you know, helping individuals with such an immediacy and such a passion to show the whole world that it is possible, that you can do it. I get the sense that what he really did on the cross is to show clearly that people hurt. It's not just evil and demons and devils and sin and systems and death. People hurt. And that's who we're called to serve. I get the sense that what Jesus really did in raising from the cross, raising from death, is to show us an image. Anything is possible in the world. There's no pain that love cannot heal. There's no need that love cannot meet. And if that's possible, doesn't that give us a confidence to aim our own lives in a direction to help other people around us? And all those things, the service and the compassion that motivates it, and the people whose lives it can be changed by love, and the hope that all lives can be changed to change the whole world, all of that we remember at this table. Here is where we celebrate Jesus' life and death and resurrection, because all of that has helped shape the world in such a way that we can do more than just a series of good deeds. We can be co-workers with God for a world that runs by love. Here at this table, we come to be renewed and to be inspired in order to be a renewing spirit for others. Here we proclaim a new world through our own actions of compassion and justice. Friends, this is the joyful feast for the people of God. They will come from east and west and north and south to sit at this table. 